This is Thursday, September 12th, 2013. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today William McFeely. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? July 22nd, 1949. And where were you born? I was born in Melrose, Mass. Okay. And where do you currently live? I live in Fitchburg, Mass. Marital status? Married. Do you have children? I have one child. Any grandchildren? Not yet. And I understand that you were born in Melrose, but you spent a little time in Stoneham and also in Gloucester. I spent my first three years of life in Stoneham, mm -hmm. and then my, my parents moved us to Gloucester, where I grew up. Okay, and tell us what your parents did. My mother was a homemaker, mm -hmm. and my dad was, um, he owned his own business, a machine shop. And how many siblings did you have? I have two brothers and two sisters. Okay. So you spent most of your childhood in Gloucester. What was that like? It was great. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, uh, it was growing up basically in a small community, because it was mm -hmm. Magnolia, which is the town I grew up in, which is a part of Gloucester. Um, had a very small community feel to it, and um, all the neighborhood kids grew up together in each other's backyards playing. So you, uh, where did you go to uh, Gloucester schools? I graduated from Gloucester High School mm -hmm. and went through the Gloucester public school system. Okay. And you, where and when did you enter the military? I entered the military uh, right after high school. Mm -hmm. Um, in 1968, that summer. And why did you join at the time? At the time I joined, um, one is I volunteered for the Navy mm -hmm. uh, because I had, coming out of high school, I was going to be 19 with a low draft number and I didn't want to be drafted by the Army. Um, so I chose the Navy because I could get education out of it. And uh, actually the Navy was the preferred choice. Did family or friends join the service when you did? Friends. And they, uh, were they all Navy? One was Navy, one was Army. Mm -hmm. Did they make it through okay? Uh, did they make it through all right? Yes. Where were you sent for basic training? I was sent to Great Lakes in Illinois. Tell us what that was like. Interesting. Okay. Um, in that basic is, is where they separate you from being an individual to being a team member. And, uh, and it's just an interesting process, I thought, um, because I had already had three years of junior ROTC in high school, um, Army, so I, was, I knew all about the drilling and that type of thing. So it was just kind of fun and interesting to go through and work with the other people in my group. Was this the first time you spent outside of Massachusetts? Aside from for, for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had done the childhood thing of going to, to camps when I was, so I'd, I'd gone away from home for short extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. Now you said your pro the process was interesting. Was there anything you liked or disliked about BASIC? No, the, it was, in retrospect, it was, it was, it was just a blip on mm -hmm. my history because it was only, I think it was 10 or 11 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, you know, it was, it was learning about the Navy and it was, mm -hmm. it was some physical training but not a lot, and it's fairly easy to get through. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing that sticks out in my mind about BASIC, and it just has to do with history, is that at the time they were having the, I believe it was a Democratic National Convention for mm -hmm. at that year, and they were having huge riots, and we saw in the camp basically across the street all the National Guard when they showed up and we were like, what's going on? Because we had very little information uh -huh. being fed to us. 
That's right. Chicago was close by, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Did you receive advanced or specialized training beyond basic? Beyond basic, I went to the Navy A School for damage control. Navy A? A School. Oh, A School. A. And what was that about? That was to teach me the, the trade they wanted me to do, which was, um, was damage control and firefighting. How was it determined what kind of advanced training you would receive? Uh, through, through testing that they do, um, they do basically aptitude testing, mm -hmm. where they determine what your strengths and weaknesses are. And um, then they give you a list, and they say, fill this list out of areas that you're interested in. And I, bit, I think I put damage control way at the bottom of the list and thought that they'd pick me for something else. My strength was actually drafting, mm -hmm. but that was a closed rate, so I couldn't get in it. Mm. So then they, they just kind of went down through the strengths and said, mm -hmm. we're going to put them here. You have, you have mm -hmm. not much choice yeah. once they get to that point. Okay. Tell us what happened after basic. After basic? Uh, when, and the A school. And the A huh? school. And then um, the, the people I went to the A school with, they divided us into three groups. Mm -hmm. um, one group went to Guam, and I was with them. One group went to the Philippines, and one group went to gunboats in Vietnam. I was lucky enough to get to Guam. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Were you sent right to Guam after they divided you? With, with a couple of weeks off, but mm -hmm. then we'll just get your orders, you get on a plane, and you go. Okay. Tell us what uh, the trip to Guam was like. Uh, long. <laughs> arduous. Um, six hours to the west coast, six okay. hours to Hawaii, and then another six hours to Guam. And the final leg was on a basically a military transport mm -hmm. type of commercial jet where they jam on probably 20 percent more people than they... it was pretty tight. Right. But still it beats, you know, if you're going during World War II to Guam, 18 hours or 18 days in a boat. <laughs> in a boat, right. Right. Yeah. Once you get to Guam, what, uh, what was your rate and what were your duties? Right when I got there, I was um, in E3, which is, uh, I think I was a, f a fireman, is what mm -hmm. they called me. Um, and the duties were, again, when we got there, they divided us. For my group, they divided mm -hmm. us up into different areas. Some went to tugboats, some went here, and some went there, some went master arms. I got to special services for whatever reason. And um, then it was just cutting grass, taking care of sports areas, you know, making sure the softball fields were ready for games, making sure, you know, driving a van. So it was basic stuff that when you start out working, you do mm -hmm. the very basic stuff that, as they get you going. Mm -hmm. So you turned from a fireman to basically a recreation director. Not even a recreation director, just a recreation worker. Okay. And as, a, as I stayed longer, then they would assign me specific duties. Mm -hmm. And they actually sent me to swimming pool maintenance operator's school. So I'm a government trained swimming pool operator. And then they had three swimming pools in the um, in the housing areas where, mm -hmm. where the servicemen lived with their families. And then they had a, a big beach area. And basically they, from such it was, it was my job to kind of oversee that, mm -hmm. the, the special services side of, of those three areas. Mm -hmm. During the Vietnam War, what was Guam considered? Uh, was it considered a recreational area? Was it considered an active station? It's, it's, it's a very active station for, mm -hmm. for the Navy and for the Air Force. At the time, we had a naval station 
had a naval air station, had an air force base, had a naval hospital, you know, it, naval communication stations. I mean, it's a big military mm -hmm. station. So you, uh, in your duties, you got to see a lot of folks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you see um, native Guam? Uh, a lot. I worked with them. Uh -huh. yeah. And what were they like? They were great. I mean, the people you worked with were great, friendly, um, open. Um, they would invite you over to their homes occasionally for what they call fiesta, but really it was just a large cookout. Um, and those were fun. Mm -hmm. the, the Guamanian people, like the, the, the you know, teenagers to early 20s, mm -hmm. really had, didn't like the American military being there in such force all the time. And they had some attitude problems about. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, the, all the people that you would work with and, and deal with, especially if they were working at the bases, mm -hmm. couldn't have been friendlier. Okay. Of course, you're, you're in Guam during the height of the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and were you getting uh, like regular letters from home? Were you getting news updates from TV? I would get regular letters from home. Mm -hmm. um, and we would get regular updates through like the Navy Times mm -hmm. um, and, and ra some radio. Mm -hmm. So we kept, kept abreast of things. What was your opinion at the time about the anti-war protesters? Actually, I don't think I had strong feelings one way or the other. I was, mm -hmm. I was doing a job. Right. I had signed a contract to do a job, and I was going to do it to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the protests going on, mm -hmm. um, they're very remote to me from mm -hmm. where I was. How long were you stationed on Guam? A year and a half. So now, see, from the time you volunteered for the Navy until you got off Guam, we're now in middle of 69? 1970. 1970, okay. Tell us what happened next. Um, I was um, assigned to um, the USS Providence, which is a, a light cruiser um, based out of San Diego. And by that time, I was a third class petty officer. So from Guam, you're back to San Diego? Right. Okay. Basically, I went from recreation to the Gray Navy. What were your duties there? Um, it was various. I was assigned to um, the damage control shop. Mm -hmm. or I was in our department, which was repair. Mm -hmm. um, for a long time, I was the ship's carpenter. So I had the carpentry shop, where I made lots of plaques and lots of boxes and lots of stuff. Were you ever out to sea, or just basically hang around? Out to sea, uh, quite a bit. Okay. And where did you go? Um, in the first year or so, we went to San Francisco. We went to um, Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. We went to Seattle. We went to Vancouver. We went to Hawaii. And what Some of which were training cruises. Training cruises. Right. Aside from training cruises? No, no mostly if we went out, it was all training okay. readiness. And how'd you like it? Being at sea? Mm -hmm. Loved it. I mean, especially when you get to visit some of the nice, yeah. nicer ports. Some, the of the, some, of the, some of the ports were, were, were nice to visit. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things they say about the Navy is that um, you're almost guaranteed to travel, and, mm -hmm. and you do.
So tell us what happened then. Uh, we, I mean, you were stationed on the Providence. Uh, how right. long? Uh, how long were you on there? I was on there until 1972 when when I got out. Mm -hmm. um, in the last year, mm -hmm. um, we made a almost an emergency rush trip across the Pacific to um, to Vietnam, mm -hmm. and I spent the last six months of my time in the Navy on the ship. Mm -hmm. We were on the gun line. Uh, tell us a little more about the gun line. Where, where exactly was the gun line? Well, the gun line was any, anywhere offshore in mm -hmm. Vietnam. Okay. We called it the gun line because you, once you pull up to that, mm -hmm. you're in active combat mm -hmm. and the pay changes. You know, um, not that it's ever worth it to be in a war zone, but mm -hmm. you get combat pay, you get hazardous duty pay, um, everything that's related to it. Mm -hmm. And um, we were offshore, supporting Marines, supporting mm -hmm. Navy, supporting the Army. My ship was part of the flotilla that sailed into Haiphong Harbor the night that they mined it. Mm -hmm. And where is Haiphong Harbor? North Vietnam. North Vietnam, okay. It's part of Nixon's plans. Mm. So what was it like being in Vietnam right there? Well, I mean, I was on a ship, so mm -hmm. I never put feet on the ground. That's, mm -hmm. um, and it was, you were trained to be there, so it wasn't that we were afraid or mm -hmm. scared. It was just once, once you realized that they could be shooting back at you, and occasionally they did, mm -hmm. you, you knew that you were in harm's way. Right. But being surrounded by a fairly large ship with armor, mm -hmm. it's not as worrisome as it as it could be. I think if we if we had more act, if it was more active, mm -hmm. and we were like one on one with a Vietnamese naval ship, which they didn't have, mm -hmm. it would have been different. World War, the World War II experience that sailors had was frightening. Mm -hmm. How long were you in this particular situation? About six months or so. It's right at the end of my time in the Navy. Right, so you're at, were you going to decide the re-up or you just wanted to get out? I was offered, um, when we're in the war zone, um, it came right down to it, I was offered a a bonus to mm -hmm. resign, and I thought about it, and actually I almost considered it. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also focused on um, the next, which was to um, come out and basically finish my education, which which was a mean, one of the main reasons I went in was so that I could have money to mm -hmm. go to school. So it was a coin toss at one point. Right. Because they offered me, I think it was ten thousand dollars tax free, to resign for another hitch. But the That's real coin toss was that I didn't want to get on a helicopter. Mm -hmm. The only way off was by helicopter, and luckily we pulled into the Philippines the day before I was supposed to get off. Oh, you were lucky. I was lucky. <laughs> When did you leave the Navy? Besides 1972. Well, 1972 was was mm -hmm. when I finished my active duty, mm -hmm. um, and then there was two years of um, inactive reserves that I was obligated to. So, any time in that two years, they could have called me back if there had been a real emergency. Mm -hmm. And where did you leave active service? Were you in San Diego, or I left to active service in San Diego. Mm -hmm. What happened after that? Right after I got out, my dad flew out um, to San Diego and met up with me. Mm -hmm. um, we spent a couple of nights in San Diego and then we got in my Volkswagen Bug and we drove 8,000 miles across country in a couple of weeks 
which gave me time to decompress with him mm -hmm. and talk about things and reconnect with him. Mm -hmm. And he had always wanted to do a cross country trip. And when I said, I have a Volkswagen bug, he goes, perfect. <laughs> How long did it take you to go cross country? It was almost two weeks. Mm. We, we, we sort of rushed, but we sort of took our time. Mm -hmm. We didn't go in a straight line. Okay. Back in Massachusetts, I take it. Back to Massachusetts. What happened after that? Um, by the time I got back, I think I had a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and then I had already been um, accepted to a school in Boston a technical school for industrial and applied photography. And it was a one-year program, and I started in school. Did you adjust to civilian life all right? For the most part. For the most part. I had, I had some issues more in reception mm -hmm. of old friends had for me than in general, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I adjusted to school and being yeah. in school just fine. I had some friends that had gotten wrapped up in the whole peace process, mm -hmm. protesting, and they actually called me names. Mm -hmm. And I had to leave places just to not get any get not get in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. But I found friends who were accepting and welcomed me back mm -hmm. and helped me readjust to. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, aside from being on inactive reserve for two years, did you join any uh, military service organizations such as the Legion or VFW? I am a member of the American Legion. Mm -hmm. What I really did was um, I got into living history and um, reenacting on board the Constitution. And I joined a group that we were interpreting um, early Marine Corps from 1797, and then we switched it to um, 1812. And we dressed in 1812 period uniforms. And I did that for 21 years. Cool. And it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. And it was with most of the guys in it are retired were retired or former Marines. Mm -hmm. They accepted me as former Navy, for what it was, and um, always reminded me that I was Navy, not Marine. Mm -hmm. Yet they let me, in the last eight or nine years of it, I was actually the ca captain commanding officer of the Marines on board the Constitution. Wow. As a civilian volunteer, yeah. uh -huh. acting, a, acting a part. Mm -hmm. But it was it was a it was a blast. I would have loved to have seen your act. <laughs> it, it was interesting. It was fun. Mm -hmm. Now I understand you also attended UMass Boston. I attended UMass Boston. And that for two years. Two years, and that was back in the seventies when it was first on the Harbor Campus. I was I was in the um, when they opened up the Harbor Campus. I was in the first freshman class entering that would have spent a full four years there. So I was like in the first class when they opened up that mm -hmm. campus. Tell us what that was like. Um, it was college. Mm -hmm. um, I was on the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. I was also on a, a Massachusetts State program, which was very generous in that they welcomed the veterans back by offering them um, basically a full ride to any state college or university. So all I had to pay for was books and supplies and I could take any classes that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I spent two years there overachieving by taking almost double the classes each semester that I could. And it was, it was just, I, I, I considered myself, that was my job. Uh -huh. So I went to class and I studied and I... What was your major? Uh, it, it was art, and I also had, um, if I had stayed there, mm -hmm. in the first two years I took all the art and history, art classes, studio classes, independent studies, and all my core requirements, 
-hmm. I basically completed them in two years. And um, the anthropology department had wanted me to declare anthropology as a major. And I, if I had stayed there, I probably would have done that. But I transferred. And where'd you transfer to? I transferred to Massachusetts College of Art, which is more of a professional art college. Mm -hmm. And I majored in photography. Well, they call it media. Well, uh, what what you do there? Just photography. Photography. Sculpture. Mm -hmm. Sculpture. And just a lot of photography, a lot of sculpture, mm -hmm. painting, drawing. You did a lot of stuff. I just didn't do basket weaving. <laughs> but no, I mean they were, mm -hmm. the courses were there to, to take. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I took full advantage of them. Okay. So with all the college, after you left the Navy, where are we now? What year? Uh, we are in 1978. Okay. So this is after the end of the Vietnam War. We're still dealing with the, the after effects. The after effects, right. Yeah. What happened next? When I finished when, yeah. school, mm -hmm. um, I got married. Mm -hmm. Moved to New Hampshire. My mm -hmm. first wife and I had horses mm -hmm. and a farm, and she was a farrier and gave riding lessons, and mm -hmm. I was somewhat the farmhand. Uh -huh. Another new experience. Another new experience. <laughs> so I spent my time cutting hay and taking wood down to heat the house with in the wintertime. And mm -hmm. I was in the best shape of my life doing that. I, I, I bet you were. How long did that last? About three years. What happened after that? Um, we just, she decided and we decided that it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that I was blatantly unhappy, I was just not happy. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I moved back to Massachusetts and started working in the photo industry, which is really what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't able to do it up there. And she went on with her life. And we're still somewhat friends. Okay. What do you do now? Well, you're skipping some. Okay, go ahead. Uh -huh. um, when I came back to Boston, I started working, like I said, in the photo industry. Mm -hmm. And um, a friend of mine from the first school I went to um, had a business, and he offered me a job to get me going. Mm -hmm. And then I switched to doing um, photo lab work with another friend of mine from that same school who was the production manager at that place. And she got me into the lab work. And then I went from there to, um, I learned the craft. And um, I went to work for one of my professors at Mass Art, who was starting up a business, mm -hmm. um, basically doing setting up a, a color lab in a lab to work with artists. And that's what his business. He, he publishes um, artist portfolios. Mm -hmm. as, well, he still does that. And um, I helped him set up a business doing that. We started working for artists from all over the country would come and print with us. Mm. And I did that for quite a while. Mm. And then about 12 years ago, because I went to work for him and then I went to work for other la another lab in Boston for like 10 years, uh -huh. but it was all photo industry mm -hmm. and doing all kinds of different things in that, in a, more in a management position right. than anything. Mm -hmm. um, I. I realized that I couldn't work in Boston anymore because my daughter was going into middle school and one of us, either me or my wife, needed to be closer to home mm -hmm. for her. So I took a job in a manufacturing company in Lemonster, entry level, took a 50% cut in pay to do it, 
but I was willing to do it because I needed, mm-hmm. and uh, and I still worked for that company after 12 years, mm-hmm. and I went from entry level to now I am the um, production manager. I'd always been doing the production management, even in the lab work. Mm-hmm. So it was, a, it was a transition. I just had to learn culture and language and the manufacturing side. Right. But my background from my dad, which growing up in a machine shop, mm-hmm. um, and learning drafting early on and actually working for him as a draftsman at, when I was in high school, mm-hmm. um, lent itself to me going into manufacturing with schematics of drawings, building mm-hmm. machines, and Okay. Bill, let's, um, let's go back a little bit and talk about the difference about uh, when you came home from Vietnam and when soldiers from the uh, like the Gulf War and no. the current engagements are coming home. Uh, talk a little bit about that. To me, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy with the way that veterans now are being received back into the communities mm-hmm. um, because they're being welcomed back with open arms as members of the family. You know, when they go away for a while and they come back, they come home, they get a hug, and they're thanked for their service. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very subtle thing, but it, it means the world to a veteran coming back. Mm-hmm. Um, back in 1972 when you came out, basically if you had served any time in Vietnam, especially in a combat role, um, I mean, when they say that people would call you baby killer and all kinds of names, they would do it to your face. Mm-hmm. And they would do it in a very militant way. And you know, how do you react to that? If, you, if, you, if you're trained to react, Sometimes you just react, mm-hmm. um, but but you receive it with great sadness. I I was doing a, I signed a contract to do a job. Um, would I pull a trigger on a child? Mm-hmm. It de- would depend on how threatened I felt, and and I felt that my friends were ar- around me, mm-hmm. to to whatever was going on in front of me. But you never know. You know you can you can intellectualize it and say. I would never do that, but you don't know, you know. But but I basically had signed a contract to do a job, and I went and did my job, mm-hmm. and I came back. I fulfilled my contract. I didn't really appreciate being called out to things that mm-hmm. didn't, you know, that I didn't experience. But it was sad. It was mm-hmm. just sad that. But you know, I was able to process through that with the help of friends, and mm-hmm. you know, and being accepted by good friends. Some people that you know I've known since the '72 mm-hmm. are still lifelong great friends, and uh, and I appreciate them. Mm-hmm. But when I see what's happening today, I mean, it just I think it's great. Mm-hmm. You mentioned earlier you're a member of the American Legion. Are you an active member? Not really. Okay. One of the reasons it has it has more to do with the post that's in the town, mm-hmm. I think, than if it was a very active post. I'd probably be more active. But. And that's that's an issue that's that's come up, especially when I'm talking to fellow Vietnam veterans that. Uh, as military posts like the Legion, the VOW, the AMVETS, uh, their core membership seem to be World War II and uh, Korean veterans. They're, well, no, they're dying, they're dying off, and so seems to be the military post. As a Vietnam veteran, or at least a veteran of a later war, uh, what do you think could be done to help? Uh, Posts such as even the one that I think you might it would have to, to. I think it would have to do with um, outreach and mission. Outreach mm-hmm. and, and mission. I mean, I understand they do a lot of you know they they, they try to do a lot of community work and fundraising. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but I think just having a, at least in Fitchburg, mm -hmm. um, a much more active presence mm -hmm. than, um, and I tried, I mean, I've tried to figure out how to mm -hmm. do it, but every time I go over by there, there's nobody ever there. Mm -hmm. They say, well, first Tuesday of every month we have a meeting, and it's either I'm in a meeting of my own or right. something else. Mm -hmm. So it just never kind of works out. Yeah. But I think it would have to do with, you know, activity, mission. Right. Especially uh, like outreach to younger veterans. That. To more women veterans who seem to be the right, the, the most rapid. Uh, it's the quickest. It's um, In the modern military, women um, have a much more active mm -hmm. role than right. they did back when I was in. Mm -hmm. Bill, is there any um, any character or any other um, incident that you remember from your Navy days that you'd like to talk about? Well, I mean, there's lots of things that mm -hmm. I, I remember, but it's like, mm -hmm. you know, they just they would be just ordinary day-to-day -day mm -hmm. activities. Is there anything else you'd like to say for this interview? No. Okay. I, mean, I don't want to try to that's all right. ramble on. No, that's quite all right. Well then, uh, William McFeely, we thank you so much for coming and taking part in the Native Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with it. Thank you.